Thank you, Donna. Um, thank you again for the invitation to come across the Pennines, but also thank you to the organisers for thus far at least in organising a very interesting programme and um, builds quite nicely into what I want to talk to you about. Um, my title on the programme is The Rise and Fall and Rise of Public Health. Um, the full title, I think, which obviously for brevity I shortened down for the programme, is really the rise and fall and rise and fall and rise of public health, and particularly in brackets in a European context. Um, what I plan to do, in obviously not a great details of in um, so 20 minutes, half hour or so, is to go through various of dark ages, golden ages of public health and talk about what lessons there are for, to be learned for the future um, of public health. But before I go into all of that, I want to talk about what public health actually is. Um, one of my ongoing struggles, really, as Professor of Public Health is to try to explain to people what public health is. And it may sound quite a simple thing to do, but actually it's quite complex, because it isn't a discipline as, say, obstetrics, paediatrics is, but it's more a way of thinking, overarching a wide range of medicine, but more generally sort of public policy. So in many ways, this is one of the many, perhaps, official definitions of public health I could put forward. It appeared in the Wanless report, which incidentally was commissioned by Gordon Brown when he was Chancellor of the Exchequer, which is interesting in his own right, the fact that the Treasury was commissioning a public health report rather than Department of Health. Remember, the definition is as follows. The science and art of preventing disease, prolonging life and promoting health through the organised efforts and informed choices of societies, organisations, both public and private, communities and individuals. That itself perhaps is not very helpful, so I want to tell you a, my own personal story. And like Sir and I started off, and indeed, you know, I'm still a, I'm a medic in my day-to-day -day practic um, practical profession. And I got bored as a medical doctor. I got bored asking the same questions, requesting the same investigations, prescribing the same drugs. And it felt a bit like you were standing beside some water and seeing a, seeing a series of patients drowning and jumping into the water, delving in, bringing them out, resuscitating, and at the same time then seeing somebody else drowning and jumping back in again. And that was a bit the American round of clinical practice. And this analogy is sometimes used around public health because what public health tries to do is to describe as upstream thinking and thinking, well, why are people falling into the water? You know, is there a sort of mass merger up there, sort of people just chucking them in? Or is there perhaps a bit more practically a bridge that is broken? And the role for public health is to go and mend that bridge to stop people falling into the water for the clinicians to try and save. So what's the difference between clinical medicine and public health? Well, I would like to try and say that all professional health professionals are public health practitioners. I often sort of struggle with that debate. But if you think about the consultation going on up and down the country as we speak of a mother perhaps speaking to a doctor or a health visitor about whether to have um, little Johnny sort of immunised, in many ways, this is a purely individual clinical decision that's being made by that patient or the mother on behalf of the patient and the health professional. And in some ways, that has got nothing to do with public health. But when you start collating all of these different consultations going on as we speak, then this is public health. The process, you know, as Heather referred to, around to immunisation, building up herd immunity, is a key plank um, of public health. But it's more than that. What public health is involved with, it's all of these processes, devising the child immunisation programme, evaluating sort of safety of vaccines, ensuring the cold chain, putting together health promotion campaigns, um, GP incentives to make sure that they do the process, employing health visitors, um, having child health clinics available for people to go to, and of course very topical at the moment in relation to availability of flu vaccine, ensuring there's enough vaccine about to give um, to the child or to the patient. So that's the context, what I understand is what public health is about. Let me start taking you through this historical process then, which is all part of the, the theme of this conference, and start off with the first dark age of public health, and again, I'm referring to this uh, with a little bit of license in terms of, sort of history here, but um, to get the point. 
Um, and again, taking a very European perspective, because even during this period, you know, we could appoint to what's going on in the Middle East, um, in the Indian subcontinent, China, Egypt, etc., when arguably it wasn't dark at all, but had very deep glowing lights in relation to public health. But I mean, going back into antiquity, most cultures, religions, etc., even very early and very primitive ones, practice cleansliness and personal hygiene. And this may not be for public health reasons. It may be for religious reasons, for example, to be pure in the eyes of their gods. And epidemics weren't seen as a health issue, perhaps divine judgments as the wickedness of mankind. But moving on to the first golden age of public health in of ancient Greece, the first attempt at rational scientific, scientific theory of disease causation started to occur in the 5th and 4th century BCs, particularly people like Hippocrates in his work Airs, Waters and Places, who made the first systemic attempt set forth to set forth a causal relationship between human diseases and environment. And indeed, the, sort of, this sort of way of thinking um, was um, common and the main theory in Europe going up until the latter half of the 19th century. This sort of moved more seamlessly really into the second age of public health with ancient Rome, who weren't perhaps so much interested in theory, but practicality. I think the Romans were very sort of practical um, race in terms of, um, you know, in terms of conquest, etc. But fire aqueducts, sewers, public baths, for example, very much putting the infrastructure in place um, around public health. We weren't particularly interested in the individual, very much looking at the population level and using population structural environmental measures um, to affect um, public health, where the individual citizen was a passive recipient rather than being an active participant in their own health. Next, we moved into the second dark age of public health in the post-Roman era. I put up a black space because this is what classically historians do describe as um, the Dark Ages. Probably Dark Ages move to the, so the end of the first millennium. For the purpose of this talk, I'll stretch that forward um, a bit, really, to going up to the um, sort of 1300s. When we move into the third Dark Age of public health, featured with plague and pestilence, particularly um, the Black Death, for example, but also taken going forward in terms of cholera, typhoid um, as well. And then hitting the third dark age around the Industrial Revolution. In the early 19th century, the growing towns of Britain and, of course, Europe more widely were characterised by pollution, overcrowding, poor housing, contaminated water and disease. Very fertile grounds, again, for uh, major epidemics of cholera, typhoid, etc. Finally, as we move into the 19th century, uh, we emerge from the various sort of series of dark ages into what I call the third golden age of public health with great ref social reformers such as Edwin Chadwick, a um, very famous um, prominent person in the field of public health, who in the 1840s argued that disease was the main reason for, uh, that disease, the main reason was poverty and preventing disease would reduce um, poor rates. But again, the measures that were done in the 19th century, particularly around to the great public um, acts relating to sewers, um, housing, etc., were very similar to the approach of the Romans, where the public were, were passive recipients of the interventions. So we see, for example, the great public health acts of the 19th century in 1848, which allow for the setting up of a central board of health which could in turn either enforce local boards of health in those areas where particularly had high uh, mortality rates or allowed um, local boards to be set up in their own right by petition. And indeed, you, you had the situation by the end of the 19th century where many councils were very proud of their local board of health and were sort of publicising what they were doing. Um, but you had water supplies, sewerage, street paving, some clearance, some clearance <coughs> happening during that period. 1872 Public Health Act, every local authority had to adopt a medical local officer for health. And 1875 was uh, had various consolidation measures, providing a comprehensive code for public health, enforcing laws around slum clearance, provision of sewers, clean water and the removal of nuisances. So again, 
the individual really wasn't involved in all of this, um, other than perhaps, of course, if he or she and the family happened to live in the slum and obviously their home was being knocked down. So I couldn't say that there were any negative consequences um, from the individual, um, far from it. But you could see here a process which really public health measures hadn't moved on over a period um, of nearly so 2,000 years. Perhaps, uh, I think a lot of the major public health movements happened in the context of war. Um, perhaps one of the most important ones was the Boer War between obviously the um, Britain and sort of South Africa, which revealed that half the population were unfit for military service. And the government accepted it had to pass laws to improve, improve the situation for the individual poor. So we see a shift here between the previous golden age, where using more population measures, between focusing more on the individuals. So in 1906, we saw the introduction of free school meals. 1907, medical examinations and the first appearance of the NIT nurse, for example, around sort of head lice. Um, 1908, old age pensions were introduced. 1911, National Insurance Act. And all of this leading up really to the culmination of this in 1948, when the NHS was established. But before we get ahead ourselves, we just have to observe another thing that happened in the end of the 19th century. Um, and although in many ways this still forms part of a golden age because um, um, communicable disease control, microbiology, virology, etc., are still crucial elements of health protection and public health function, you've started to see some very key scientific developments happen at the 19th century with very famous scientists you know, like Louis Pasteur, Robert Koch and his postulates, for example, sort of starting to isolate characterizing bacteria, um, Lister um, advocating antiseptic surgery, um, and other people looking at you know, the causation of different diseases you know, relating to mosquitoes, um, fleas, um, etc., etc. We're starting to see a move away from um, population measures, whether it be structural change in terms of housing sewers or even population measures in terms of programs to a focus down on the individual and where diseases were being caused by individual actions or the interaction between a host and a bacterium and the environment, etc. So um, obviously many can't really sit through a public health talk without being shown a slide um, like this. This is mortality rates um, from measles. And of course, a lot of fuss is being made around MMR, for example, in recent years in terms of vaccine to prevent measles, mumps, and rubella. Um, but actually, vaccine was only introduced in 1968 and made some diddly squat impact, really, um, on the um, overall mortality of measles going back over the last 150 years. And these differences were being made by your classic public health measures by trying to re reduce overcrowding in the slums, etc. So um, we start moving really into more recently, you know, the third golden age of public health, very much focused in around sort of still addressing these emerging um, public health threats at the end of the 20th century. Some of them were real, a lot of them were imaginary, and particularly imaginary in terms of politicians' minds in relation to bioterrorism, etc. So you had SARS, um, MRSA, and sort of typically around sort of HIV AIDS, where we're really focusing in on um, from the mid-1980s around the need to have public health measures where, as, an, as of yet, um, the interventionist approach from the pharmaceutical industry had yet to, to bear fruits. So, typically, still swine flu still on the agenda. The question I pose to you is, what is the solution to swine flu? Is it Tamiflu? Absolutely not. In many ways, Tamiflu has been discredited um, because of causing more problems than it's actually worth on a population basis. Certainly, it has been some benefit to some individuals in intensive care settings. Has it been the vaccine? No, it took quite a while for the vaccine to be developed in, in any case. Um, what made the difference and will continue to make the difference in relation to swine flu is the good old traditional public health measures. And it's at times like this the politicians do like us. Um, most of the time they don't really like us particularly or they ignore us. 